welcome to this observability clinic. So uh, first of all, we are very, uh, thanks for joining and listening to this presentation, to this webinar, which is live, in fact, today. Uh, we are going to talk about something specific and also a great announcement. I'm pretty sure that you will be just excited as I was when I saw that feature. Uh, for those who've been doing performance engineering or other stuff, you will see it's just uh, fabulous. So you'll see it's going to be amazing. So today for presenting this amazing topic, uh, I have the honor to have a Wolfgang Beer, which is a principal product manager. So hi, Wolfgang, how are you? Hey, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Um... And to talk about the newest uh, trick we we learned, Davis. So I'm very happy to to present today together with you. And uh, we are going to do a mixed presentation. So Wolgan will explain the main idea be behind this new feature and 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 uh, you, how you can leverage Davis AI in a different way that uh, you probably have been. Uh, if you've been using Dynatrace since a couple of years, a month, uh, you know how Davis is picking up problems. You see, it's going to be different this time. And uh, before we start, actually, uh, small housekeeping rules. Uh, it's a webinar. So for those who's uh, connected live, thanks for to joining us. Uh, so you probably don't have the chance to uh, ask your questions with your mic and you don't have access to chat. So don't worry, there's a Q&A panel, and I will look at the Q&A panel and answer, we will try to answer to all of your questions during the next hour. All right, so I think, uh, Volgen, I'll let you start and go through the topic that we have today. Sure, so uh, let's start. Um, I would like to uh, welcome you um, and to talk about the newest trick, as I said, that uh, we learned Davis. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty um, uh, honored and, and uh, pleased that we finally um, uh, were able to, to push that uh, functionality into production. Um, and we worked quite a while now for, um, for presenting that kind of feature and that new trick uh, for Davis. And it's uh, one of the first um, features in Davis that, that you can um, uh, use on demand. And I will explain in, in the next couple of slides what, what I mean by that. And then handing over to Henrik again to, to give you more, more insights and, and a live demo uh, in the Kubernetes space and to present some, some um some uh, patterns. Let me... Ah, okay, thanks. Uh, I was struggling to I saw control it. the slide deck, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so what you will learn today uh, in our session uh, is uh, what actually is Davis exploratory AI analysis. Uh, you see a glimpse on, on the right side and how you can leverage that kind of uh, uh, manually triggered uh, Davis AI analysis. And, and then handing over to uh, Henrik to give you some insights on those um, patterns that you can uh, analyze with that new feature, how you can use it, how you can leverage it for uh, within your own Kubernetes teams. Um, and how you can use Davis AI to optimize Kubernetes uh, workload kind of uh, uh, resource uh, uh, conditions and, and to plan ahead. Uh, and and uh, at the end, uh, I will also give you an overview about uh, the details of, of the algorithm uh, and, and how we implemented it, what's, what's behind uh, the scenes. And um, we are following up uh, a strategy of pure transparency here on, on this newest uh, AI feature, which means that uh, all that is presented today is seamlessly uh, documented in a very detailed uh, uh, fashion that you can read about the details and then can you build trust up, uh, trust on, on that kind of uh, AI functionality. Can you click again, please? 
So uh, I, I put that slide um, about uh, those pillars in, in, into that session today in order to uh, explain uh, and to not confuse you about the existing versus the new functionality. So what I presented in the past, I would say one and a half years, were those four pillars of the existing Davis AI um, engine that we have within the Dynatrace core uh, platform since years. And it's about detecting anomalies. Uh, it's also about, I click again several times, um, about reducing noise by merging single events um, and, and to group them together into consistent problems in, in a consistent problem structure. And Davis automatically uh, analyzes the, the incident and trying to find the most statistically most sound root cause component and then highlight uh, the remediation uh, possibilities and uh, together with captain or external um, integrations like Ansible or uh, your own uh, Terraform script or whatever you, your company uses, you can then trigger uh, auto, auto remediations in order to fix uh, the things uh, that, that, that uh, Davis detected uh, that are broken. But that, that is the functionality that was available uh, until now and uh, that did not change. Uh, so there should be no confusion about the fact that this is, stays unchanged. We are not talking about that uh, capability and those capabilities today, but we are rather more speaking about the complete new feature on top, which is the uh, explore and optimize um, feature. Um, that is shown here, which is another additional pillar that you can now use in an exploratory fashion uh, and to analyze any kind of data situation uh, in, in, in the screens that are presented, in the pages that are presented in Dynatrace, and it's dedicated to explore, exploratory use cases and optimization use cases. So that is new. And that means that everything else that you see on the left side uh, did not change in the way it's operating. So no worries, problems are still opening, alerting is still working as expected. That has nothing to do with this new uh, blue kind of explore and optimize pillar. So those are two uh, different uh, topics. Can you go uh, further? So uh, what is actually Davis exploratory analysis? Well, in the past, we, we heard a lot of criticism uh, that you have to, to get an incident to see Davis uh, working in reality and, and to, um, to trigger Davis to, to come up with uh, root causes and uh, to help you to, to identify uh, problematic uh, uh, relationships and, and uh, signals, metrics that, that are behaving weird. And if you look at the Dynatrace uh, technology pages as of today, like uh, one of the most prominent uh, pages is, of course, the host screen, the PGI screen, the processor screen, um, the, the, the services screen, and, and the Kubernetes screens, but also those screens that are introduced uh, by extensions and by technology enhancements and extensions that you can um, easily um, uh, install and, and acquire through the Dynatrace hub, uh, with, where the, one of the most prominent and more, most successful one is the F5 firewall uh, extension that comes with a, with a tailor-made page that gives you all the detailed information right uh, into your face uh, about how F5 how your F5 instance is, is operating, but nevertheless, uh, it's filled with hundreds of individual metric signals. Uh, and it's not only those metric signals that you see right in the page, uh, in most of those pages, uh, hundreds or even thousands of those uh, metric signals are hidden behind drop downs, um, hidden behind lists, uh, and tables 
uh, that are referenced uh, in those pages and that are filled dynamically by using the SmartScape topology. So you just have to imagine uh, that host page uh, that lists, for example, that dynamically lists all the running processes um, that are running on that same host or the F5 firewall uh, with the virtual servers, with, with, the, um, with the pools um, uh, that are running on, on that uh, F5 firewall. And you can imagine that uh, software architects or even me um, discussing incidences and, and uh, issues together with software architects, we are, we are spending hours digging through the, all those signals uh, by, by having maybe one, one reference signal that somebody complained about or that looks a bit weird or increased uh, in terms of resource consumption. And then you have to go manually digging through all those signals, finding all the entities that are related and digging through all those signals as well. And you can spend hours after hours looking at those signals. Uh, so with the amount of data that we are collecting in real time as of today, um, already shown on, on those individual pages uh, and technology pages, uh, it got really difficult uh, without intelligent help uh, to, to filter out the relevant and the interesting information. So what Davis Exploratory analyzes uh, then, it helps experts and domain experts and users in general to efficiently explore and optimize their systems uh, with a single click in a chart where you just manually um, tell Davis what kind of part and, and time frame of that chart you are interested in. You see a phenomenon in a chart, you tell Davis, um, you, you tell Davis the time frame and you ask Davis to analyze uh, and to explore that um, part of, of that reference series. And then um, Davis uh, will automatically uh, collect all the relevant uh, topology relevant uh, signals for you uh, that are listed on that page. And can you, can you click on the next page, please? And uh, it's shown here. So the, the process is basically um, uh, pretty uh, simple. Um, uh, you can select any kind of chart here. Um, in case that the chart contains multiple series, uh, Davis asks you to, to please select one of those. Uh, to be sure what your reference is that you uh, are interested in. And once you clicked, uh, for example, in this case, CPU user, uh, then um, Davis uh, automatically collects uh, all the reference, um, the, the reference metric signal from the current page that you uh, gave Davis to, to analyze then Davis automatically collects all referenced uh, metric signals that are listed in the current page and in all the reference tables and lists on that page um, that are topology uh, related and then calculates a similarity rank based on your selected reference chart area, which means uh, that the the ranked results then are presented in, in a side panel, as it is shown here, um, where all the uh, signals that behave uh, similar to the reference signal are listed with a proper rank. Uh, and the side panel can then be used by the user as a navigational help. Uh, once you click on one of those uh, signals, uh, Davis will lead you uh, within that uh, page uh, to the focused uh, metric. It will automatically expand um, the dedicated and, and the, the, the metric that was found, even if the metric is found in a sublist of that page uh, and the metric is somehow hidden at the tens place or whatever in a drop down of that uh, list uh, or table. So Davis will automatically focus and highlight that metric that was found, uh, expand the table and highlight the metric itself 
and give you a navigational hint uh, in that regard. Yeah, and, and that's uh, basically the, the functionality that is available now. And I would like to hand over now to Henrik to, to give us a live demonstration of that capability and how you can use it in the Kubernetes context. All right, so that's at least we, it's great introduction. Uh, we now understand clearly what's uh, the value of that feature. And you will see now, um, I, would, I had a mission here saying, okay, let's find some use cases related to Kubernetes. So as usual, what I decided to do, I looked at a potential real production stories that happened uh, over the years. And for this, I selected one, but let me make the introduction so then you can follow the story and see how Davis Insights will help us here. So you probably have moved to Kubernetes. And when usually when you move to Kubernetes, what the first reaction is says, okay, so it's new stack, it is very promising. So I'm going to do a POC. So I'm going to take a cluster, put some workload there, and then we're going to take some, uh, some conclusion out of that. And when, by doing this, uh, usually you, dis, you, you, uh, you see the value and you see that it's a bit complex, but at the end you see that deploying uh, in Kubernetes is easier. Uh, you can design much more modern architecture, uh, all the auto-scaling uh, process that you expect uh, in the modern architecture is available out of the box. Uh, so at the end, it's super awesome. You can do tons of things. So as a consequence, you say, okay, let's go for production. So you take one, one cluster and you deploy a couple of apps in that. And then a few months later, you realize that you have tons of clusters running everywhere. And as you may know, and everyone should, probably I'm pretty sure that everyone knows that, you have two ways of operating a Kubernetes cluster. You have a fully uh, managed, where you own the infrastructure in your environment, you deploy it, so you maintain the master nodes and the worker nodes, so you are the boss of the clusters. But sometimes, and most of the time, we don't use this. We go with cloud providers because it makes sense. It makes sense because uh, we, we have someone that pay attention to our master nodes, and we don't have to worry about uh, the sizing, the API server, the schedule, the, uh, all the various components are very crucial for Kubernetes. So at the end, we end up using a cloud provider. And a service, as usual, is not free, doesn't exist. So we will have to pay for uh, the, the usage of the cluster in the cloud. So let's have a look at how the cost is been splitted, especially in the Kubernetes world. So a couple of things. So first, uh, you uh, you can see that uh, the provider will manage a cluster like a with different layers. Uh, we have the first the cloud provider itself uh, because it's managing for us the cluster, uh, the the mainly the uh, master nodes. Uh, we will have uh, fees related to the management of the cluster. Then if you have a cluster and you have different nodes on different regions or zones, or you have different components on different areas, you will probably have some communication between uh, those, uh, the, between those uh, cloud regions or cloud zones. Uh, and this has been charged. Same thing if you have to reach out to internet to, do, to pull out some information, this is going to be charged as well. So this is something that you should be aware of. Then you have the node. So when we design our cluster, uh, if it's a static cluster where we have a, a fixed number of nodes, we try to figure out how many cores do I need, how many memory do I need, and if I'm doing any machine learning algorithm in the cluster, I'm probably going to use some GPU as well. So, the, of course, the, the size of the cluster itself and the price of the cluster itself will depend on the size of your nodes. Then uh, we usually use a PVC, so persistent volume claims, to store the data within the cluster. So this is also a service. So we will pay based on the size, the number of PVC, and so on. And last uh, element that comes in the cost is the network. When I uh, deploy a service, a load balancer service in Kubernetes, we will allocate an external uh, IP address. And external IP address, as you may know, are not free, so you will pay for all these IP address that we have allocated. So, as usual, um, if someone, yeah, I mean, 
And over these days, this is happening. We try to reduce the cost as much as possible because at the end of the month, someone in the organization is looking at the bill and saying, oh, uh, well, how is it? why is it so expensive? So at the end, we are asked by our organization to optimize a bit and uh, the utilization of our cluster. So how do we optimize our cluster, the cost of a cluster? A couple of things like discuss first, we size our cluster based on node. So do we really need those huge machines to handle our workload? That's a good question. Then in the way we manage or the, the, the way the nodes are utilized depends on also how we um, define our workload. So we will see that later. And by optimizing the workload, we probably be, have a better user of the node and we will be able to have more workload in the, in the, in the same nodes. And second topic is persistent volumes. Usually we try to be secure. So we try, we, in, we, we intend to uh, allocate huge uh, disk size to be able to store as much data as much as possible, but that comes with a price. So do we need that amount of, of uh, that size of disks or can we reduce a bit? And last, like I mentioned, the workload itself, the workload is critical because if we don't define it well, well, we will see we will not have no, unoptimized nodes. How do we get an unopt unoptimized nodes? Very simple. If I deploy, remember in Kubernetes, in your deployment file, you can set resources, CPU request and CPU limit. We've talked about it on several webinars uh, over the past uh, month. But just to remind when I deploy, based on my resource definitions, uh, Kubernetes will allocate uh, resources based on what we've defined and what we have requested. So if we define a huge value for uh, in the request value, then that CPU or that memory will be allocated. And as you can see here, we have the blue line almost reaching out to the available memory. So we have almost nothing left. Uh, and as a consequence, if I have a new workload to deploy, I don't have any space anymore. So I'm not able to schedule anymore that workload on the on my nodes. So we're not efficient. So even if, even if our workload is doing nothing, so we can maybe request, uh, I don't know, uh, four cores, but at the end, we only use 1% of what we requested. So at the end, we are not optimizing the usage of a node. So most of the organization, what they're trying to, to intend to do is, all right, so we have a, a cost based on the cluster. So how can I make my workload more efficient? So maybe tuning a bit the CPU request and memory. So then my node will be used in a more efficient way. So to do that, usually uh, in the theory, let's do, let's go on the theory side. Um, I simply need to look at the, my usage, my actual CPU usage versus what I have requested, and I can you know, also do, of course, the same thing with the usage versus the limit. And in fact, uh, one organization, a uh, uh, well-known e-commerce brand, did that exercise. So they looked at, at those numbers, and what they decide is okay. So let's reduce. Uh, by looking, I see that I have enough space, so I can reduce a bit. They reduced it, and you'll see we will have some issues. So I reproduced everything in this environment. So let me go through what I've prepared, a couple of things. So the, first of all, here is the link to the GitHub repo. If you want to reproduce and play around with that, uh, feel free to do that. So here I have a couple of components in this cluster. Uh, I have, of course, Danatrace operator employed. I have the Nginx ingress controller to expose my services out on my cluster. And I'm using the open telemetry operator, which helps me to deploy easily um, various collectors and other things. So that's a technical component at the end. But what is important is the application. So I have one single app running in this uh, cluster. It's the hotel demo application, where I have some load tests, by the way. And those hotel demo application will produce traces and have a collector that will be there that will send back the traces and the metrics collected. And one thing which is important because I want to look at the cost uh, from an angle. So I have deployed a solution called Cube Cost. So there it's, uh, there's, there's a payment, there's a commercial version and there's an open source version. But at least with that, Cube Cost allow you to estimate uh, the cost of the cluster by hourly based. And also if you connect to your cloud provider, you will get, uh, it will update at the end once the billing is available, uh, the overall cost that you have uh, or consumed in your cluster. So let's have a look at this. So in my end, so I am going to open my browser, which is 
Where is it? Up. Uh, it's here. All right. Up. So first thing, so here I start everything from the beginning. So I deployed my this application several weeks ago. And what I did here, I have um, I took the uh, Kubernetes cluster dashboard that and I cloned it. So that's why there's a cloned version here. Why did I clone it? Because I wanted to add extra details in this dash dashboard. Details uh, coming from the solution I deployed. In my case, it's KubeCost. So the first thing I did is I implemented an SLO in my cluster to figure out how is my node. Is there any workload in uh, pressure that I'm not able to schedule? So I would have an SLO. So I have a 99.98% what I need to be available. So that's that's for sure. And the other thing that I did, I importing those uh, uh, cube cost metrics. In fact, for that, you can the cube cost exposed in Prometheus. So you can easily ingest it, but you can also do it with open telemetry. And I did it from the open telemetry slide. So at the end, what I did here, I have um, a total cost way I'm taking. So I am um, like explain it takes the management cost, the uh, network cost, and so on. So everything this is basically the daily cost of my cluster. Okay, it's a demo. Eight point five dollars is not so much, but you, you can think about a huge cluster with more CPU, more memory, and you can expect to have that cost much more higher. And then probably you have more clusters, so that cost should be much, much, much more higher because you're dealing with uh, fifty, hundred clusters at the end of the day. So as a reference, I took that number. And then I say, okay, now what I want is to look at the hourly price uh, of my cluster. So I have uh, on the side here, the hourly costs of the node for CPU and for memory. But then why my interest, because I've been asked to optimize, it says, okay, so you have to reduce the cost. So I looked at what is the, what is the part of the cost that is the most important? So, and this is what I did this ratio uh, where I try to extract how much is the CPU in the cost and how much is the memory in the cost? And as you can see, uh, one third of the cost of, much of, my, of most of my nodes is basically the CPU. So it means if I am able to reduce a bit uh, the cost of the, the CPU uh, usage or allocation, uh, I would be able to be, um, have a more efficient cluster and be able probably to welcome more workload than just this application. So how do I do? So first, I deployed and I changed my, uh, my uh, so I have my initial version. I know that I need to reduce. And let me go back to the past. So I did some several, several, uh, several tests and several simulations. So then you can see it. So let me go to the Kubernetes namespace screen. I'm going to select uh, the namespace related to my demo app, which is hotel demo. And I have one service that I, I am really pretty much interested. First, oh, one, one thing I need to do to it, I need to figure out which service is the most important in terms of consumptions. So for this, uh, I can do it in different way. So I'm going to the node, all right? And I have several nodes and those nodes are basically uh, mod fully monitored by, uh, by uh, Dynatrace. So I can select one of them and I, I jump into uh, the uh, host uh, screen um, and going to go back to, this, to, to the past because I did several tests today and select this morning. Because this morning I was running this unoptimized version of my workload. So I think it was around here. So let me zoom in. All right. Here it is around this time. Uh, uh, no, a bit zoom, zoom in too much. So let me reduce a bit. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm going to take including the spike that I had, the one at uh, here, let's take this one. All right, so I have some, some spike included, so I'm going to select it and I'm say, okay, I'm interesting to understand part of, in that time frame, uh, the, what is the data that, what is uh, the, the component that is causing uh, this, uh, this usage, all right? So let me go again. I did. I did. I didn't select the right time frame. I need to do it again. So here it is. Here is this thing. So I'm going to zoom in. And so I have now. I have my CPU. Oh, we are happy about that. <laughs> and I'm going to take the selection. So I'm selecting 
the moment where I have a stable uh, of, of time, uh, load, and then I have a spike here. And I would say, okay, I want to figure out here, I, I don't have the time to look at all everything in dashboards. I'm very, I'm very, uh, I have a lot of things to deal with in, uh, today. So I need to ask Davis to do it. So now I just selected the CPU usage and I say, I want to look at the CPU user average and see which the metric is basically responsible for that usage. So now in the screen, there is a uh, lots of metrics. So we will let, that's interesting. Uh, we will let Dynatrace uh, Dynat uh, uh, collect everything. And it's showing me a couple of things. So first it says that we have the open time entry collector that is consuming, uh, that is related to that consumption. And then we have also uh, up, we have also, if I go back, I have some other processes that was interesting to show you. And here, I may, may not select the right stuff, but usually it's supposed to be the front end services. But yes, the collector is consuming some stuff. I was aware of that, but I'm not one, I don't want to reduce the, the collector site. So let's go back to Kubernetes cluster. Now we know that we have some work to optimize, which is uh, our, our collector potentially, but also our hotel demo component, the main service is the front end. So I go to the namespace, I have this information. And what I did, I looked at the usage of the parts. I'm, for example, I take the front and I will look at the CPU usage versus the limits and figure out how much I can optimize on that particular workload definitions. In fact, to be more efficient, what I did, I have the information available in this, class, in this dashboard. I have added uh, a table here, you see, on the right side that shows you uh, the up uh, how efficient I am in terms of usage versus the limits. And you can see that I have a couple of things. So you can see that front end is uh, currently, so it's currently now. So I've optimized it. But uh, if I go back to the time frame where I'm, I'm where I did not optimize it, I know here uh, the the ratio of usage versus what I've defined. So I, can, I have some some lists of workload where I need to optimize. So I have done the optimization and now look at the results. Let's go back to the namespace, uh, the, to the front end of service. And we are going to select the time frame where I did the first optimization. And as a surprise, you will see by reducing by 20%, because I had the number 20%, I reduced 20% of the values. And you will see that Davis, uh, that the application itself was not reacting as expected. So let me go back to the past on the screen. So let's say, uh, say the last 24 hours, and we will pick the time, which is here. This is the moment where I'm interested. Here it is. So now in this moment, I have optimized my, my workload. In fact, I can zoom in. So here is, uh, in fact, I'm here. So let me zoom in here because it's even better. And I have changed the workload definitions. And in that time frame, uh, in fact, I have also some alerts that has been detected by Davis, but I'm not gonna talk about those alerts. We, we have a dedicated webinar about it. But here I can see that since I up, uh, updated my workload, I see the response times that are unstable. You can see here, we have this uh, couple of spikes here. So I say, oh, I'm, I'm interesting to figure out why do I get that result? So I'm selecting that time frame related to the, to the moment I changed my workload definition. And I would say, all right, so I have the front end here reacting quite weird. Oh, I select the median, sorry. And let me take the average instead. Right, it's even better. Up. And then I will analyze again the yellow grief graph. And what it does, it says, okay, it's first of all, the CPU usage versus limit is not good. Okay. And I can see that I also have another metric in the bottom. It says the throttles. So it means from the moment I changed my workload without being far from the limit, I introduced throttling. So that's the first thing. So now I know that throttling as a, after changing my workload, I know that uh, I have introduced some throttling. So how do we resolve this? So let me continue the story and my slides. Up. So now we want to optimize. 
So how can I use Davies to optimize my workload? I can do it for several things. Like I said here, without the limits, we were having uh, less CPU consumptions. And now with the limit, we have a more, we control the CPU consumptions, of course, because we have some limits. But as a consequence, with the limits, we have exploded our response times. This is what we had in the, the previous demo that I showed you. So why? Well, remember, requested limits is a critical component of Kubernetes. We need to, to use it because it's the best practice, but there are tons of hard stories. We talked about it in the previous webinars and there's a QR code, you can scan it. You can jump, go to a couple of websites. I will share you various links and tons of companies have shared their experience by playing with those problems, CPU throttling due to the request, not well uh, optimized request and limits. So Airbnb, Zalando and others. Um, they, in fact, one of those companies here, they try to reduce the cost of their, their cluster by playing what I just showed you, and they came to a disaster. We also have their stories about OM kill, but here focus on CPU throttling. So how do we validate those assets? Well, for this, this is where load test comes in the picture because we can just adjust uh, the settings of the request and the limits. We run our test, we compare it to the previous, previous uh, uh, situations and we try to optimize it. So that's the manual way of doing it. There are also commercial products available out there on the market that could do it automatically. But again, if you wanna do it manually, because you, you are a performance engineer and you love to do optimizations, you are free to do it. And now with the help of a tool like Davis Insights, it's even easier. So let me show you what I did. So here, if we zoom out, so now we are at 10.30 and 11.15, the after that moment, I have tried to optimize my cluster. So let me go back to 20, 24 hours and we're gonna compare things. And we can see that from the moment I have changed the settings here, I have another, another pattern, another deployment, in fact. And you can see it's, it's even better. We can see it here. Um, and here you can see on the response times, at the, once I apply that pr the, the response times here, we are much better. We have lower, uh, lower we have the same uh, capacity of taking the traffic. We have the same traffic, the same uh, uh, application. We have less errors, and we have better response times. I mean, it's a, here. It's a spike test, but I can do it again if I want. I can use. Oh, sorry. I can use still Davis Insights to help me to figure out. I need to select again the data, and we will figure out what's going on. So here you can see that, for example, we have the uh, CPU throttling. So we can do that. I can select on throttled. Who is causing this? And Again, Davis will go through uh, the various metrics and will show you. So at the end, if you, with Davis Insights, if you have to do some optimizations on your cluster, uh, it's very simple. You can do it from a request limit. You can do from def different various topics. And if you do any load tests, wow, you will see the value. It basically helps you to drive where you should pay attention. What is causing that? So I think it's just fantastic. I mean, for, for, from a performance engineering perspective. I think I have, this is only what I, I, need, I wanted to show. So uh, uh, Wolfgang, my question to you is, uh, how does this uh, algorithm works? Uh, I'm very interested about it. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that amazing demo, uh, Heinrich. Uh, I, I really learned a lot looking at those uh, uh, Kubernetes screens, actually. Um, yeah, so with this, um, first uh, appearance of, of Davis uh, that you can manually trigger for optimization uh, purposes, um, we, we found that a more transparent way of exposing the functionality um, is necessary. There are more and more people asking about what's, what's hiding behind the magic of, of that AI functionality. And uh, for that reason, we, we introduced a very detailed a help documentation page uh, that uh, explains exactly. Uh, can you click uh, quickly? Uh, you find it here under under our official uh, help uh, section and help um, portal. Uh, we call it Davis AI Analyzers, um, and it's listed under Davis Causal Correlation Analyzers. 
Uh, we also added uh, a section that I called analysis uh, terminology because uh, there are more um, analyzers following in the future, like, uh, like forecast analyzer, cluster analyzer, and so on. And we want, we want to have the same uh, terminology, the same uh, wording uh, consistently used across all those help pages that are upcoming. And uh, if you visit that uh, help page, um, maybe, maybe Henrik, can you open that um, help page? No, not the blog, but the help page. Um, in the browser, yeah. And click on that causal correlation. Um, then you see that um, I explained or we explained end to end uh, the full story uh, along with uh, what kind of algorithms is hiding behind. So for example, uh, the basic methodology is built on top of the Pearson correlation that uh, is built on top of a relationship analysis and we apply various uh, signal transfer, uh, transformations um, and the signal transformations are listed here, like the time shift transformation and the smoothing uh, transformation. And I also make, made sure that um, that, uh, that explanation is shown in, in our own Dynatrace data explorer. Uh, so you can also replay uh, what Davis is actually doing by copying my um, um, uh, transformations here, like the time shift transformation is also available in the data explorer. So you can simply go metric by metric, uh, do, uh, you can create a chart in, in data explorer, apply uh, the two steps, uh, left and right shift of the, the uh, candidate time series. Um, and if you multiply that by a by hundred metrics that you have per page, then you can manually replay what actually uh, Davis is doing uh, in an automatic fashion here. Also the smoothing can be uh, transparently replayed in, in the data explorer. You just have to use the uh, roll up uh, uh, operation here to smooth the signal. And again, Davis is doing that in a fully automatic fashion, smoothing the incoming candidate series, uh, transfer, uh, 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 transform, transforming the, the candidate series, and then calculating a Pearson correlation uh, on top um, and ranking the results by applying certain penalties uh, based on the signal transformation and then coming up with uh, the similarity link rank as it is uh, explained here. Also what the rank means. Um, so like zero means no similarity at all and one means high similarity uh, where we, we use in that screen, we use a cutoff threshold of 0 0.75 uh, to not show any non-relevant uh, signals. Um, and, and that's exactly uh, explained in a, in a very detailed uh, fashion here in a very transparent fashion. And uh, we will make sure that any upcoming AI functionality, any trick that we uh, going further, uh, 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 learn Davis uh, in the future will be documented in the same transparent and very detailed fashion uh, to, to answer all your questions. And of course, there is, I, I missed that nearly, there is also a blog post uh, with, with a full story um, that you can read uh, if you're interested in. Uh, that's that's the first one here. Yeah, so that's about documentation, about the details and where you find uh, all that material and how you can read about those details about uh, our methodology. Awesome. That's uh, at least uh, it's uh, crystal clear for everyone because uh, we are very transparent on what how it's been done. So I think that's that's uh, quite uh, even 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 better. I mean, for me, uh, because when you're you're dealing with technical data, you want to know oh, how is it done, <laughs> and I think that that's that's fantastic. 
Um, so maybe we, it's time to uh, recap on everything we saw today. Yeah, so uh, my, my points to take away for you, um, for the audience, is uh, that our newly introduced uh, Davis exploratory analysis saves you uh, a tremendous lot of time uh, when, when you are optimizing your uh, deployments, when you're optimizing your, your systems and your services, and you don't want to manually dig through all, all the signals that, that you have uh, collected in Dynatrace, the Dynatrace collects in real time. Uh, by just one click, you save a lot of uh, uh, time. So it takes minutes instead of hours to, to check all the, the topologically relevant and causally relevant metric signals. Um, and also uh, it supplements, and that's important to note, it supplements the automatic Davis problem detection and analyzes it does not replace it. So that is still working as expected and uh, the exploratory analysis is, is released as, as a feature on top that you can use uh, for exploratory analysis and for, for optimizing your system. And uh, as, as Henrik uh, uh, showed you in some practical uh, examples, it's a great tool uh, also for uh, Kubernetes operators uh, that that constantly need uh, to optimize um, their workloads and, and their deployments. So I think it's uh, it's uh, just to add also I think it's a uh, fantastic tooling. Davis detecting problem is, is great, but like you said, it's a, it's a more a, a reactive way of detecting patterns and, and problems. Uh, here it's you have the the power in your hand to control and say, okay, I want to do stuff. I want to optimize things. And I think this feature is going to be very helpful for us. So uh, check it out in, uh, and you will see, uh, get, share some feedback about the feature. Uh, but from my perspective, I'm, I was super excited to have uh, this feature as an early, uh, early adopter, I would say. Uh, so uh, feel free to play it uh, in the end and share your feedback uh, with us for sure. Uh, before we end this, uh, uh, this uh, webinar, uh, I just want to uh, make a small promotion again to my e ch YouTube channel. Is it observable? So there's plenty of materials. Uh, if you were interested in cube costs, uh, I have a dedicated tutorial on how you can take advantage of cube costs, uh, how all the details related to it. Uh, so if you want to ingest in the future cube cost metrics in your cluster, check out the episode about cube cost. Um, before we end, a couple of uh, content and, uh, and we'll see if we have any questions. Uh, but uh, there is plenty of materials out there. Uh, and there is plenty of different observable technique available on YouTube. So check out the YouTube channel of Danatrace. There is a dedicated playlist for all the various uh, observability clinic that Andy has uh, uh, presented and recorded over the years. Uh, there are a couple of one related to uh, Kubernetes, if you're interested in Kubernetes. Uh, there is a couple of one about uh, Davis uh, that uh, Wolfgang has presented over the, uh, in the past. Uh, so check it out. Uh, we have also a couple of materials on our Danatrace University. So uh, it's also lots of great content there. Uh, and also we'd like to promote uh, Andy's uh, um, podcast called Pure Performance. Uh, there is always great guests. So check it out and listen to it. Uh, there's always great news and, and great information uh, shared uh, in this podcast. All right. So let's see if we have any any questions? I don't see any questions. Uh, it was mainly questions about the recording. As usual, for those who have never been in uh, uh, live uh, present in a live uh, observatory clinic, all the uh, content has been recorded, and we will uh, publish this recording in a couple of days in YouTube. So you will be able to watch uh, this content at your own pace in a few days for sure. All right, so I don't think any, I don't see any YouTube, any other questions. Uh, I think you answered them, most of the questions live. There were a couple yeah. of questions uh, about the ranking, but you answered it and you yeah. also covered it through uh, uh, through uh, the explanation of you know, of the algorithm. Um, so I think, yeah. There was, there was one question about the release uh, date. So basically it's uh, going live GA um, next week. 
uh, with uh, Dynatrace release uh, 255. And uh, Dynatrace managed with, will follow with uh, the even um, uh, 256 uh, release then. So it means in, in two weeks from, from now, uh, uh, will be available for all the uh, live tenants? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, uh, let's start the timer uh, and uh, make an alarm in two weeks, uh, and then you can work up <laughs> yeah. and play uh, play around it, and uh, and share okay and reach out to us to to share your feeling about that feature. But I'm pretty sure that you you will you will like that feature. Let me see if there is any other incoming questions. Uh, what next features are you planning on working on this space? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Andrew. And uh, there are things we're working, but I'm not sure we're going to share everything, every secret so far. But Volgan, do you have any anything that you can sh are you you are allowed to share uh, for today? Um, yes. So one thing that that we are working right now is um, uh, to to introduce a forecast. Um, so for for predictive um, uh, analytics. Uh, that will that will be presented at, at perform actually um and and of course uh one of of the near term goals is also to include uh, log um uh, signals in in the correlator so so that's more on the davy sites but we have plenty yes. of things that will come soon ah uh, of course uh, but, there's uh, a lot of things going on i was <laughs> too just much focused at my own uh topics yeah I'm but sorry, yes, but... if you are interested on on seeing what is going to be uh, arriving soon, uh, just to let you know, so we have our annual conference perform that happens uh, in February. Uh, so we, of course, we'll have lots of new announcement that will arrive soon with a couple of new features, of course. Uh, but uh, in perform, we will have lots of announcements, uh, lots of great news about uh, all the, the the greatest and and, and newest things that Dynatrace is going to publish over the, the next uh, month or so. So if you want to be part of it, the registrations of Perform are has been is open. So check it out and come and join us. There's plenty of great breakout sessions. And if you like skateboarding and and if you've played on on the video games called Tommy Hawk, uh, you will be even more delighted because Tommy Hawk is going to be uh, presenting a keynote there. Uh, I mean, also Casey, uh, Casey Hightower also, but uh, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a different way of, of being a fan, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, if there's any other questions, uh, I would suggest to, uh, uh, to end this, uh, this today's Observer Technique. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank Wolfgang to be here and to present all this great news. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a great session, actually. Great demo from your side. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks. And uh, so thanks for all of you who has been connected during this, uh, this hour. Uh, so enjoy your day. And if you're looking for the recording, uh, stay tuned in a couple of days, it will be out in YouTube. All right. Thanks. See you. Bye. Thank you. See you.